everyone. Thank you all for joining us today for our second Innovators on the Line live customer webinar. Innovators on the Line connects Red Hat customers with each other to discuss supported open source solutions to their business problems. We are thrilled that ACA Healthcare has agreed to be our guest on today's webinar and share their story and their journey. This organization recognized, was recognized last year as Red Hat Innovator of the Year, and we look forward to hearing how their story has expanded since then. During the webinar, if you need assistance or have questions, we have support to help you address your concerns. Please type these in the Q&A chat room. We will kickstart today's session by introducing our guests from ACA Healthcare. After the introductions conclude, we will spend time talking about their story. Once you hear about ACA journey, we have time set aside for questions. You can type your questions in the chat room, and I highly encourage you to do that throughout the presentation. Without further ado, let's move to our introductions. My name is Atif Chuktai. I lead the healthcare market for Red Hat at North America. Our speaker today will be Daniel Chitsari, Consulting Data Product Engineer from HCA Healthcare. Daniel has been with HCA since 2014, where he started as a platform engineer, and in 2018 transferred to the clinical service group to focus on more DevOps-focused roles. As a system architect and a technical engineer, Dan proved out enabling technologies like OpenShift and an ecosystem of tools to improve both development and operational efficiency. His DevOps focus role is where he will continue to build out foundational capabilities for data scientists at H for data science at HCA. Dan came to Nashville in 2014 from his hometown of Chicago, Illinois. Dan, I will pass it on to you to get us started with today's session. Thank you. Well, thank you, Atif. Um, it's great to be here, and it's great to talk to everyone about this. Um, thank you for the, for the wonderful introduction. Um, as you were saying, I've been with HCA for what is my six-year anniversary this week, and um, I'm here to talk about the uh, OpenShift platform and what it means to healthcare and what it means to innovation as a whole. Um, so I will be going at a, at a high level. I'm going to start with a little bit of backstory and a little bit of um, historical view. Uh, I started with the uh, design and build team in 2014, and I was mainly responsible for building a whole lot of Red Hat hosts. And after a while, we started to get the idea that there was a better way to do things instead of deploying physical or virtual hardware from, uh, from the ground level up each time that we needed to make application changes. And there was a lot of buzz in the field around Docker and around Kubernetes. And, and, I, and I went to um, one, of my, one of my customer sites and said, I, I really want to explore this idea about OpenShift because I think this is a great production model for alleviating some of the heartburn we have around timelines when we're deploying these large-scale infrastructure events. Um, so for those, of, for those of you that don't know, HCA is the Healthcare Corpor Corporation of America. We have a little over 180 hospital sites a lot of medical and, and med surge, and a lot of emergency rooms, a lot of uh, care clinics, and we're responsible for quite a lot of the healthcare in this country, um, as well as the UK. And so I looked at what, what it would take to roll out something enterprise-wide and what that would get for the teams that I was involved in um, and that's kind of where I came across the solution of, of Red Hat's OpenShift because um, it got to a point where the timelines were so severe to getting infrastructure built up, I said, I can take all of that away by just deploying this one thing, and then you guys, um, you, you're, you guys, when I say you guys, I mean the developers in my organization can 
make pushes at their leisure um, as fast as they need to instead of constantly having to go back and submit um, kind of long timeline change control, control requests. So the initial uh, proof of concept that I got that I was uh, in talks to roll this out for was for sepsis. Um, so the sepsis prediction and optimization through therapy is our spot tool, um, and that's the reason we won the Red Hat Innovators of the Year Award back in 2019, um, which to me seems like a lifetime ago. Uh, but it was a way to automate the medical information that gets input into our um, EMRs and parse that information and start to give a more accurate reading of when when the, the, the statistics around a patient or, or any person that's in a hospital is more susceptible or has sepsis. Um, so the, the kind of the biggest struggle that we had in the, in the beginning was um, getting the data feeds put into place and making sure that um, everything was being parsed correctly and making sure that, um, that all of the data pipelines were, were correct, and then applying that to new infrastructure or new development initiatives and aligning with the company's goals that rightfully so, and as healthcare changes in, in this country, um, get to align with what is the current state instead of the legacy view of, of what the problem was. Um, so, um, so this is our, our healthcare or overview. Um, this is basically the, the, um, the total stats of our hospital. So you can see we are, um, I believe, within the top, in, in the, one of the leading top healthcare providers in the U.S. We're located in Nashville. Um, we have 184 hospitals, and we are in 21 U.S. states and in the U.K., um, and we see 34.8 million patients and with well over 280,000 employees, and that does include nursing staff and doctor staff. Um, so when you roll out an, an enterprise-level solution to for a platform and then subsequently for Spot as a development platform, um, those, those, those employees aren't coworkers, they're customers. Um, and they've got a very high stress job and they've got a very um, demanding job and they can't be, can't be bogged down with process. So you're looking to take away some of, that, some of that heartburn and you're looking to replace it, not with a way to replace them out of a job, but a way to augment the role to take some of the strain off of them. So that's kind of where we were at in the very beginning of we were looking at how we were doing, how as a healthcare company we were doing sepsis screens and the CSG group, the, at the time it was the clinical services group, which is what I'm in now, um, really said there's got to be a better way of doing this. We've got all the data, we just need to have a, a way to funnel it and a way to do something correct with it. On to the next slide. Um, for for everyone on the on the call that doesn't doesn't know, um, sepsis is the uh, the deadliest disease in any hospital. Um, it happens very fast, completely preventable and completely treatable if it's caught in time. Um, there is an increase in mortality. Forty-seven percent every time for every hour that treatment or detection and then subsequent treatment is delayed. So it is one of the few things that it grows rapidly. It grows very rapidly, actually, and it's completely solvable as long as you can detect on it and as long as you know about it. So that's kind of the challenge we were up against was affecting not only patient care but patient care when you check into the hospital, you are you're at the worst part of your of your of your year. Even um, 
you want to make sure that the nursing staff to the doctor staff to the hospital staff, they all have the tools and the best tools that they can have so that they can make sure that when you're at your worst and, and coming into a hospital, they can be at their best and they have the best tooling available to help them do their jobs. Um, because the faster that they can react is the better you're going to be. Um, so that was a, a big part of what we were what we were looking at and the, some of the struggles we were trying to trying to solve. Um, so yeah, this is this was our challenge and goal. Our challenge and goal. The challenge was sepsis detection is done manually. Um, it's done with clipboards. It's done at shift change, um, which is everyone knows nurses shifts are long, 12-hour shifts. Um, if you're only putting in data and and doing a sepsis screen at the beginning and end of a shift that is a that is 12 hours where something can go wrong and something can start to grow inside inside a, a person and before it gets detected so that is um, the matter of life and death that, that 12 hours can absolutely define how you're going to be treated and if you can be treated um, and we really wanted to make sure that we put software and put something user-friendly enough in front of nursing staff not to try to take that aspect of their job away from them, but to give them better information and better tooling to be able to do their jobs more effectively. Um, it's never been about replacing nursing. The, they're, they're absolute heroes and they, no one could ever replace them. But if you give them better tooling, you can make their make their job easier, um, which benefits everybody. Um, so we, um, as, a, as a group, we started uh, working through a small POC, which was an open shift cluster built um, through, through a kind of shadow IT means. Um, the, the POC cluster that we had on had, had very little funding, and we weren't really sure it was going to be possible, but um, we all went in kind of shoulder to the wheel and said, we're going we're gonna to give this a whirl. And I had, um, at the time, I had an entire department backing me, and uh, the tar department was uh, approximately 20 or so data scientists, a handful of data science engineers, and just me and another guy, uh, me and Nick, which were the DevOps guys, and uh, uh, Postgres DBA, Josh, and um, and so and and then uh, just that group saying let's uh, let's try to figure it out. So uh, we did a whole lot of a whole lot of Tableau and a whole lot of um, machine learning and tried to roll it all in through Datomic, who's our vendor, and it turned into a really nice, really nice piece of closure code that was run through on OpenShift in an, in a, in an OpenShift environment. And I was able to spin up pods and spin up a nice little ETL and a way to think Active Directory and all the, all the other nice things that, that you need to have in, a, in, in your microservices view. And we'll we'll get to the microservices view in a couple different slides later, um, but yeah, that's that's what it started as was a very very small, what has grown to a very large department, and of course we partnered with Red Hat. Couldn't have, really couldn't have done it without them. They were um, with us every step of the way, helping us make sure that our platform was up and available, and making sure that we had the tools and the information we needed to be able to put this into Docker containers properly, which um, depending on where you are in your life cycle, it, it, is, it is a steep learning curve. And there's a lot of engineering learning that goes into deploying to production and then scaling that to an enterprise. Let me move on to the next slide. Um, and the other side of this was getting executive buy-in making sure that the right people knew what we were trying to accomplish, making sure that um, down to a hospital level, each individual hospital is run as its own separate 
um, I don't say separate, but its own little microcosm entity. So you, we had a whole lot of business leaders that would go out into the field and start to evangelize and start to uh, train staff on new software and the processes and all of the all of the specialized um, uh, data or workflows that would have to change because of it and help them adapt what we were offering them to the organization and then give us critical feedback to the engineers to say this this really doesn't work from them and we would be able to quickly roll up a solution and deploy it to prod for that environment or deploy it to prod for everybody else and it is a is a nice way to kind of make everybody happy um, but also get them the best tooling so it's it wasn't just tech that solved the problem there was a great deal of evangelism there was a great deal of um, partnership with hospitals to make sure that they knew what we were trying to accomplish and we were listening to them when they said we're gonna we're gonna try to get there with you Um, and the result of that has been pretty amazing. We are average a five-hour decrease in sepsis detection, um, which, if you're um, if you're not familiar, five hours is massive in a world that work moves by the minute. Um, so that is, uh, we've seen just an astronomical decrease in related deaths at hospitals, which is just, it's, it's amazing to say out loud because I don't get to say it this out loud to, to everybody every uh, very often because everyone on, the, on my team kind of knows the impact they've had, so I don't really talk about it that much, but it's, it's truly awe-inspiring to work with all the people that I do and seeing what we've accomplished just in the last year. And... Um, the best part about this has been the open collaboration with other groups, uh, making sure that we are pulling in security people when we think that we need their input, and pulling in data scientists and developers and DBAs and having our own little DevOps focus group around this, this tooling has really paved the way for new efforts um, and other teams to quickly follow suit. Um, so this is our solution architecture. Um, it is largely uh, all OpenShift based. Um, lots of persistent volume claims within the non-prod environment to pull in data. Uh, no persistent volume claims in, in production. It's all run completely stateless. And we are relying on the integrated Docker registry to OpenShift and we have actually rolled out a custom tool for promoting images from non-production to production. So we did go ahead and um, 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 don't have the, the, the hardware architecture diagram on this, but we did roll out two clusters uh, within OpenShift or for OpenShift um, to our, to our on-prem deployment. One is a production, one is a non-production. Um, everything gets written and pulled from Git to, to production. We have our own build configuration. We have our own source to image, or our own image configuration. And we wrote a custom tool to do that promotion from non-prod to prod, um, just as a, a nice way to uh, fulfill, fulfill security and audit requirements around logging changes. Um, but to do that in a fashion that didn't impede the developers from working quickly. And then this is our complete uh, CI-CD pipeline. Um, so there is a handful of, uh, handful of technologies I'm sure everyone's familiar with. And I guess the, uh, the, the main pro the, the main takeaway from the slide that I went on to have is, have is um, this is specific to our development team and our group, um, but this does not, there's going to be very little that another 
that um, without the development cycles and the ability to learn and how this stuff works, you're not going to be able to do this just without a whole lot of manual um, undercurrent reading um, and, and effort. So it's, it took a long time to get to what this slide represents, and I imagine this isn't even remotely where this stops. It's just where we're at today. Um, but it's def definitely a, uh, it's a steep learning curve, and it is a hard model to have um, anyone outside an organization tell you best how your organization works. You're, you're, you're your own strongest advocate, and the, the, best, the best thing I can say is uh, our motto, which is uh, fail often and fail quickly, and that's the best way I know to learn. Move on to the next slide, um, and here's some of the um, some of the before and after results from the sepsis prediction tool. Um, so you can see the the when we were at a manual process, we had um, approximately 20,000 screens performed. We had a 3.3% hit rate, and afterwards we had. Um, 722 spot detections and a 92.2 percent hit rate. So those are huge numbers to go up in um, just in the amount of screens and the amount of, of um, in the amount of uh, detections either detected or not detected. Um, it's been a, a huge burden off of the nursing staff to be able to say, I don't have to worry about doing this manually anymore. I can rely on this tool and it's not doing my job for me. When it says panic, I have to panic, but I can, I can rely on this and, and, and do that. Um, so this is a, an example of what the business leaders did. The business leaders that were having meetings with the CMOs, the chief medical officers, chief nursing officers at hospitals, they were trying to beggar, better, best figure out how this works at an, at, at an actual hospital and with nursing staff because net, nurses are our front line and they are already taxed, they are already completely overburdened and we wanted to make sure that what we were rolling out wasn't going to be another undue burden on them. We were actually alleviating some stress and not adding on. So this was a big part of showing them the signal and then really coordinating with them to show them what to do with it. Um, and this, is, this was all the business, uh, the business development and, uh, and our executive staff, that which were really making great strides in, besides the technology, we're really making great strides in, in what this looks like. On to the next slide. So this is where we're at today. Um, we are at 30,000 patients monitored and screened every day. We are at 75% um, sensitivity. Um, we're at a little under 92%, so we're at a prediction accuracy of about 91%, and that still represents a five-hour time advantage. A time advantage. Um, this has also given us the the kind of um, the kind of ability to see if there are problems within our data pipeline that other teams manage and maintain, and be able to give them concrete proof of this isn't a problem for you now, but it will be in a couple of months. Um, and here's all the things we're able to uncover because of how we're parsing and, and ingesting your data. We're able to give them tangible concrete evidence of there's something you might want to worry about that is not here today, but it's coming down the line. Um, and that's been a huge advantage to other teams around us because we're, we see everything real time. So we're able to give them long in advance heads up when there's a lurking problem that they're not completely aware of. Um, and this has really gone into what, it, what has been um, an interesting year. Um, this 
set up the groundwork, not just for sepsis, but around, um, around a lot of our COVID-related activities and efforts. Um, much like everyone, we've, we've all been affected, and we had a, um, a large-scale pandemic come to this country in a very, uh, very ferocious manner. And we were largely caught with a lot of, a lot of what do we do now? Um, and this is what we learned in the sepsis rollout allowed us to roll out in, in, in the same field around COVID-related activities and um, supply chain, bed management, uh, discharge predictors, all got rolled into a new tooling that we are that we spun up, which uh, spun up a couple months ago, but has been rolled out enterprise wide with um, in in a little under two weeks, which is pretty amazing. We were able to um, build a, build a dashboard very quickly, get that dashboard up, get it parsing the right information, and be able to get relevant information to hospitals, but also get relevant information to divisions um, so that when there's a large-scale pandemic, there is a lot of information that you have to parse, not just at your hospital, but around your hospital and other, other, other facilities to know if my, if my, uh, if I have a large scale, a larger scale problem that I'm anticipating in my state instead of just my hospital. So what we learned there really allowed for us to to spin something up quickly and use a lot of the same access patterns and models for, for COVID-19 that we use for SPOT and just parse different information, but we were able to, uh, to really spin something up, something pretty amazing. Um, so, yeah, I, I am going to go ahead and uh, wrap it up with, with uh, um, 30 seconds to go. But uh, thank you for the opportunity, and it's been a pleasure talking with everyone. Thank you, Dan. That was amazing. Thank you. So let's take some questions uh, from the folks on the line. Uh, please type those questions in the uh, box. We'll continue to uh, monitor that. And uh, let's, without further ado, let's take some questions. So uh, one of the questions that came in, I think I'm going to combine them together. Uh, the question from Linda was, what kind of ROI is ACA getting from the solution? And what were the stats before the uh, solution was deployed for sepsis? Sure. Um, so ROI is, ROI is actually very hard to calculate because we're we're obviously we're a um, we're a public company, but we're a, a for-profit company. So we we do worry about business costs and deployments and things like that. But at a basic level, we want everyone to be healthy and we want to save lives, and that's our that's our mission and that's our primary goal. So ROI is is something that um, I calculate in terms of. How many hours do we have for, um, how many hours heads up can I give nursing staff uh, about a, a, a positive sepsis screen to give them more time to get a patient better? Because um, that that could be my parents, that could be my son, like that could be anyone. So um, as far as the actual calculation of, of business costs versus, uh, of business costs versus uh, bare metal, um, uh, bare metal VMware and, and OpenShift. Um, it's it's something that hasn't been, as far as I know, hasn't been independently evaluated because the two architectures are vastly different. Um, and we do deploy on VMware for VMs for OpenShift and bare metal. So there's a little bit of a of a, of a Venn diagram when it comes to those environments. Um, the stats before the, the solution was deployed, um, it's, it's just probably just as good to talk about where um, um, 
where we came from and where we ended up. So we have a, a five hour increase in, in, a, in, in the prediction model to where we give nursing staff on average a five hour heads up when there's a positive sepsis screen. Um, so if you, if you start at zero, you, you end up at negative five. Um, but it's also just about taking the strain off of nursing staff, taking, um, giving them a tool that they can rely on and they can look at and they can, can do the, the million and one other things that they have to do to do their jobs. No, it makes sense. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for those insights. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to quantify the ROI in terms of life safe, but then there are other factors that you just mentioned in terms of time saved with the nurses, you know, better customer or patient experience, uh, less overall, like, you know, uh, complication from their stay that can result in straining your resources. All are part of the ROI that can be accounted. But you know, as such, the number of life saved by itself is a huge factor. So um, for this thing and capability to work, you needed the data from EHRs, right? So how did you go about connecting the data from EHRs for, to this application? So that involved uh, a lot of separate teams. Um, so we are, we are primarily, we have, we don't have one EMR, we have multiple e EMRs. So our, our, so one of our biggest ones is Metatech. Uh, Metatech parses data and actually saves logs in real time to our, um, our Hadoop cluster. And that is available to us by HL7. Um, so we have HL7 listener feeds. Um, set up by firewall rules between the OpenShift environments and the um, EDH, which is our uh, electronic uh, data warehouse, to talk to them specifically, to talk to um, specific topics that are available based on those feeds. Got it. Uh, okay, let me know what other questions are coming through. Uh, one question from Sina, .NET or Java applications? Uh, no .NET. Um, we are primarily Python and uh, Clojure, and then there's there there are some there's some Java on the front end. Got it. Uh, one other question that came up, and let me try to uh, summarize it. So this solution could have, could it have been written using a traditional rules engine versus actually using an ML engine and doing self-training? What, what were the areas from your perspective that called out for using ML versus traditional rules capability? So um, simple rules, from, from my perspective, simple rules really defines and really, really takes a couple things to heart, which is uh, a static, a static environment. Um, so we went with the, we went with uh, a more ML um, defined approach because Meditech changes, um, data changes, and, and patients are, we're all unique. So it's it's going to be it's going to be very hard to write in a, a a binary answer to a what is a complicated question. Understood. I mean, you have a constant uh, movement of the target environment, and as such, you need a model that is quickly adaptable. Versus you having to recode and redeploy new rules. Uh, for that environment. So that's right. essentially what we're able to establish. Okay, that's pretty interesting use of that technology. And you, um, yeah, you really have to worry ahead. about developer burnout when it comes down to it. Developer burnout's um, real, and the more the more active changes that they have to make, and the more every day can feel like a panic if you engineer things wrong from the get-go, um, 
developers, they have a hard job and they then the, the less strain you can put on them, the better. I've heard physician burnout. This is the first time I'm hearing developer burnout. So yeah, somebody's paying attention to developers <laughs> for sure. Uh, all right, one other question uh, that came up. Uh, how is the adoption of OpenShift and the CI CD pipeline going outside of this project at ATA? That's from Jason. So Sure. Um, surprisingly well, it's been, it, it's, it's been, um, there are, there are, uh, I believe now, uh, 12 other teams that use OpenShift. Don't quote me on that number, but I know it's, it's a pretty significant amount. And, um, we have uh, a lot of significant org changes based on, microservices and uh, this type of platform. So we have an official DevOps team. We have an enterprise architecture team that is more microservices focused. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's gotten, it's gotten pretty much fire here. Like it's, it's, it's been pretty good. Yeah. Glad to hear that uh, folks continue to ask questions. Um, monitoring that a uh, lot of good questions coming in then we have a, a pretty well engaged audience which is all, always good so one question came in i guess this is related to the roi question that was asked earlier from uh, somebody named mr french is the outcome improving your quality rating and the positively affecting rates negotiated with health plans i mean have you guys connected uh, this to what it has done for your underlying business? You know, um, I am not sure. And I am positive that if there were, there were conversations around that, that I would not be involved. <laughs> okay. Uh, another question came in from Linda. Uh, that's an interesting question. Oops, it just moved. Uh, from a, a sponsorship executive sponsorship perspective for this project was this primarily led from the it side or was it like on the clinical side i mean who how did it uh, from a sponsorship perspective played out and who did you have to go to get create a buy-in for all of this sure um so the the shorter answer the short answer is all of the above um the long answer is um even though we're developers we still report up to clinical our, our, our group is the clinical services group renamed to clinical operations group so we are clinical even though i i i will never um i'm not a phlebotomist i will never go into a hospital and administer medication to a patient but i am absolutely clinical and, and everybody on my team is also so we we don't draw, or at least I don't draw a differentiation between the IT side and the clinical side because we're both, we're, we're all IT and we're all clinical. Um, so the, um, the other side of this is we have executive business partners or executive sponsorship at the clinical level in my organization and they set up, uh, they set up, um, on the other side with the, the chief nursing and chief medical and, and the clinical on the actual field side. Um, so the people who will be using it kind of, they work in conjunction and, and go that way. Understood. Understood. So I mean, it's basically the end user, you have to create their buy-in on the chief clinical side and uh, work, work alongside with them. Uh, to bring this idea to forward. Um, another question that came up is around what aspect of OpenShift specifically facilitated all of this? Uh, what made OpenShift uh, be your choice? And also, how did it help you guys? Um, the thing that made OpenShift so appealing was um, well, my my experience and my my training has always been in 
in Red Hat. Um, so I, I'm always inclined to go Red Hat before I go to anyone else. Um, but it was about the robustness of, of the actual application, how it could be scaled to multiple data centers, um, how I, I wasn't tied into a lot of the same vendor lock-in that other vendors have within their Docker implementations. Um, so if, you know, no offense, Atif, but if I decided to port everything away from OpenShift, I absolutely can. I'm not, I'm not tied into that. Um, and then it was familiar, familiarity. It was, I, I like Red Hat, so I've used it for years, so why not just keep in there? Yeah, no, we appreciate you saying that. Uh, that is our mantra, to make sure we are incompatible and open. Uh, that's important for, for the ecosystem that exists around us. So from, from the development of these models, uh, for sepsis, were anything like you know the capabilities built in the CI/CD? How did those play in to help you refine these models and iterate over them? Uh, any thoughts around that that you can share with the audience? Um, you broke up for a second there, Atif. Could you repeat that? Yeah, sure. So from a OpenShift CI/CD perspective. And the refinement of the model for continuing experiments and refining them. Can you share your thoughts on how did OpenShift play into that aspect uh, and helping you guys improve your models for sepsis? Sure. Um, so that that comes down to the um, the image spin up, uh, the the ease of use of being able to spin up a new image for an S two I build. Um, it's once you get the hang of it, it's it's actually a, a very very easy, very repeatable process. Um, that's a that's a big asterisk on once you get the hang of it in front, um, because it is it, it is very complicated. But once you get in the rhythm of things, as you start to find out, um, you know, new JDBC or ODC, ODBC connections that you need to need to adapt in, you need to be able to roll those in quickly and get those to the developers. But it was, it's um, at a, at a extraordinarily basic level. It's a, um, it's, it's just a closure algorithm. It's, um, it's, it's, it's baked into the image and that's what's deployed. And that's what is, um, and that's what's running live in, in separate capacities. Understood. Thanks, Dan, for that. Uh, one other question that came up, uh, it's around, what was the training data used for building the ML model? Uh, sorry, this moved. Uh, training data used for ML model for prediction. Which algorithm is used here? Uh, I don't know if you can share any of the details there. That that sounds like a really heavy data science question, and I am going to precursor that with, I am not a data scientist, and um, there is plenty I don't understand. I work on uh, platform, I work on CI, CD, um, but as far as the actual uh, data science models, um, I can I can try to get you answers, um, and, I, and I know exactly who I'd ask, but I, I honestly don't know off the top of my head. No worries. Thanks, Dan. Uh, so would it be fair to actually follow up to this question to ask about what kind of data feeds are being used for this, making this prediction? I mean, outside of EHR, is there other things that you guys are consuming data or is it all coming from EHR? And if you don't majority, know? majority of it comes from EHR. Um, there, is, there is a little bit more that comes from Teradata and there's a little bit more that comes from um, there's a there's a data lake and it's it's SQL based I know that but um, I forget the actual name of it but there's there's a little bit of Teradata there's a little bit of a, uh, SQL Alchemy and then there's most it's mostly HL seven. Got it. Sounds good. So uh, one of the other questions as I scroll through, and folks, please uh, 
keep the questions coming, all great questions. And this is really for you guys to interact with our customer. So I encourage you to uh, keep asking questions. Um, one of the question was, uh, what have been some of the biggest challenges around uh, being successful as a team? Um, and how do you make sure those challenges uh, do not hinder your progress for your project? Um, I could write several novels on that. Um, some of the biggest challenges uh, for, um, for everybody that wants you to succeed, there are, uh, there are people who don't, there are always going to be people who, who challenge a new way of doing things. Um, it's not so much that they, that they don't, uh, don't want you to be successful. It's that they, they don't understand and their default answer is going to be, no, I don't understand it. Um, so there is plenty in, in an organization, even a small organization, to affect that um, pretty monumental change. Um, it takes a lot of top level um, evangelism. And after that is, you have to work through the actual the, the people in the organization who actually hands to keyboard do some work for you. And um, I'm not going to lie. It's, it was, it was challenging in the beginning days. It was, it was a lot of, um, not shadow IT, but giving people, people that you needed specific tasks for, um, just very little parts and pieces so that you could just get small things that can accomplished. Um, so yeah, there was, there were some, there's some pretty big challenges within, uh, even, a. a a low to or, or a small to mid-sized organization affecting really platform level change like this. Yeah, I can imagine, and as such, you probably have to deal with the cultural shift and the process shift, uh, which is all part of you know any disruptive technology that you're bringing in, uh, in at such a scale to a massive organization. Uh, so. I can only imagine how challenging that was. A good job on you and your team uh, getting through that. Um, one other question that, that was asked uh, by Elizabeth. Uh, you mentioned logging changes. How did you incorporate audit log and change management into the design and, and build? So um, we were actually, so obviously we have um, GitHub and we run that on-prem. And uh, that's where that's where code changes are, are pushed and pulled from, so we can go off of main and and, and non-main branches. Um, but from there, it's built within non-production, and we actually um, that's one of the one of my team members, Tommy, wrote a custom tool, which is a, a web interface that is able to talk to um, call an API from non-production OpenShift, pull from its registry, and then Docker pull, and then Docker push to production. Um, and one of the things, and that really does three things, not just the image promotion from non-prod to prod, but it also lets you link up a JIRA ticket so that there's a, a logging record that that push happened. Um, and that also links to the specific hash for how what is what is being pulled and pushed, um, and that fulfilled our audit requirement of, uh, of making sure that there's some sort of peer review and that there's some sort of logging that a push happened. Yeah, and especially in the world of uh, healthcare data, you know, you have to have these detailed logs to meet HIPAA requirements and stuff. So uh, definitely sounds like a very uh, cool way to do it. Um, one question that came up uh, from Gabby, can you speak a bit more about the effort around COVID tracking uh, and what outcomes are you seeing from that effort as well? Um, COVID tracking. So there's a, there's a, 
good way to answer that question, and I'm going to struggle with it. Um, the nice thing if you want from COVID, go ahead. Go ahead. The, the, the nice thing we have about COVID tracking is that it works at both a granular and a um, and an enterprise scale. Um, so what we're what we're publishing to the field actually um, defaults to a uh, kind of a country or a, a division level access um, to where if you're if you're um, the CMO over multiple divisions or multiple hospitals, you can look at those independent overlays, or you can look at all of the overlays that you want access to. And and the same goes for um, some of the some of the chief author, officers that want to look at more of a national view of how this how this information is coming in and going across. Um, but it also gets very granular to where. Um, a hospital administrator or the CEO of a specific hospital can look at his hospital and drill down to the actual uh, meat on the bones and say this is what's going on in each individual bed. So it's a it's a really neat timeline that we have within some new tooling that we've that we've deployed enterprise wide to be able to say we're no longer specifically just in the app development. We're, we're in the framework development phase of this. Um, we're not trying to solve one specific question with one specific answer. We're trying to give you bigger and better tools that kind of go in and say, here's, here's all the information, or if you want to drill down, here's the one specific piece that you want. But it's up to, up to you to, to tell the tool what you want versus telling us and then we tool it. Okay. <clears throat> no, thank you for that um, sharing. If I were to follow up on that, um, how long did it take you guys to put something like that together? Uh, with what we learned, what we learned from the sepsis prediction, um, that effort was um, it was in POC about six months ago, and it had uh, it had basically one guy, Nathan, working on it. And after he got the POC off the ground and everything started to, to really catch on, now it's got a, now it's got a full fledged team around it. And, um, now he's got lots of, lots of people working on it. So it got deployed enterprise wide in, um, I believe eight or nine days. Wow. <laughs> but, that the development before that was was around one hospital, and it was just the P, it was the POC, and then it, it it scaled very rapidly. Wow! And I assume that you were able to scale so rapidly because you had the unified, uh, you know, architecture throughout your hospitals. I mean, you didn't run into issues. What was the reason for for scaling so fast so quickly? All of the above, we had um, we had successful buy-in from executives. They've seen what we can do with the spot tool. Um, we had an enterprise architecture that was already deployed. All of our pipelines were already um, were already intact. We um, it was just everything was already built and tooled for this specific pandemic or any pandemic, and so we were able to really scale up very quickly because of all of the lessons learned and all of the documentation that we spent the last, you know, half a decade learning. Wow. Okay. No, I, obviously you guys are supporting the frontline workers in this war that we have against the pandemic. Really appreciate everything you and your team and the IT staff is doing. And uh, thanks to all of your healthcare workers for being out there and supporting the population the way they have been. Uh, as such, I, I do want to ask if there's anybody else has any question. If not, uh, we're going to end this uh, webinar. And let me just scan one more time if there's any more questions. Uh, well, I see oh, people I saying off. <laughs> so. Oh, I I like the IO, IoT question. That's a good one. Go ahead. We got, we got two uh, minutes. There is, 
Yeah, the, the question is, are, is, is IoT type data from the hospital setting a potential data set to help improve the machine learning accuracy? And the short answer is not yet. Um, we actually got our first IoT devices in a POC status um, with this year, um, and it was one of the major efforts when, when the, when the world got very different very quickly. Um, so that is something that we are doing, and we are exploring very extensively. Um, but yeah, it'll, it'll, it'll. The next year and a half are going to be extraordinarily exciting. Yeah. Once they come. Yeah. As they come, yeah. I mean, IoT definitely brings a new wave of data feeds and uh, new insight that we didn't have before, and uh, uh, that could actually open up a lot of use cases uh, outside of what the current ones are, or even make them more effective, right? With the smart devices on us and uh, history tracking. Uh, with that, Dan, uh, thanks again for all your leadership and your effort on this plat uh, on this amazing project and sharing with the community here. Uh, folks, if you have any questions that are still left, uh, we didn't get to, we'll follow up. Uh, but I believe we got to all of the questions. Uh, if you think of something, feel free to send us an email and we'll follow up uh, with answers to those questions. Uh, Dan, anything in the closing remarks? Uh, just keep wearing masks and keep six feet, six feet away from other people. That's all I ask. Yeah, same here. All right, thank you, everyone. All right, thank you. See you next time.